Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight at the Brockton Writers Series for July 14th, 2021. Uh, we wish to acknowledge that the Brockton organizers do our work on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron Wendat nations, uh, and more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And we want to acknowledge that con con colonization and genocide and racism have impacted Indigenous people, and that settlers like us have a responsibility to make spaces at events like this for Indigenous voices, and to acknowledge the way that systemic oppression works throughout society. We're all obligated to understand, uplift, listen to Indigenous voices uh, on in critical issues such as missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, the environmental devastation of resource development, the neglect that Canada has shown Indigenous communities in terms of infrastructure like education, healthcare, water and housing, and of course, implementing the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, we can never achieve uh, reconciliation until every residential school location has been searched. Uh, we know that the numbers of bodies that we've been hearing about is large, and we know that it will be larger and larger still, um, and we must see this through. Brockton Writer Series also acknowledges that Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to feature and center Black and Indigenous voices, as well as other marginalized voices, including people of color and people with disabilities. Uh, and all of this is in our mandate. And thank you very much to FMRS Series for hosting us on their online platform um, during this time. Today's lineup is a guest speaker with a brief Q&A, and then our four readers, uh, followed by a group Q&A for them as well. Each presentation will be a little shorter than when we were in person, and we will skip the break. Please type your questions into the YouTube chat box as they occur to you. We will collect them to ask during the Q&A. There's a bit of a time lag, so if you type them when you think them, um, that helps resolve that. Emily? Brockton Writer Series was founded in November 2009, which means we've been active in the Toronto literary scene for over a decade. Our Brockton Writer Series volunteers are Hannah M. DeMichael, Nancy K. Clark, Dorian Emerton, Sonia Patare, and I'm Emily Sanford, and we have the pleasure of working together to keep the Brockton Writer Series going. If you'd like to join us, check in with one of us after the readings, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we would like to acknowledge with deep thanks the continued support of the Ontario Arts Council who make this series possible. During these pandemic times, we are also indebted to our gracious host, Jen Albert of Ephemera Series. Uh, check out the Ephemera events right here on this very YouTube channel. Uh, and their next event, I believe, is Wednesday, July 21st. Finally, our sincere thanks to you, our audience, for being here with us tonight. Now on to Brockton's guest speaker. Tonight's guest speaker, Sonia Vaillant, is the manager of audio production with Penguin Random House Canada, where she helped to build and develop the audiobook program from the ground up and has produced over 125 audiobooks. She has a background in both audio and theater production and will never be able to narrow down her favorite book despite her best efforts. She loves cooking, gardening, and hanging out with her dog when she is not busy reading. Here is Sonia with Audiobooks 101. Hello, hello. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to do my best to give you a rundown of what it sort of looks like having your audiobook produced for the first time if you are an author. Um, I will give my my usual sort of um, proviso that I, I work for Penguin Random House, so I'm not entirely sure what some of the other presses do. I, it does vary from publishing house to publishing house, and I know that there are definitely some differences for um, small press publishers. Um, I do know a little bit about it, but I've worked primarily with Penguin Random House Canada, so I'll be mostly talking about how we do things. So experiences may vary. Um, so the first kind of major question is usually what books are chosen 
to become an audiobook? What um, gets the go ahead to be put into production? Uh, so that is decided by the publishing house. For us, it is pretty much anything that is a frontless title, anything that is being um, originated in Canada. So it's usually developed or produced by the territory that is also originating the print. Um, we do our best to do all of the books, um, but depending on capacity, sometimes that varies a little bit. Some might uh, be produced a little bit later, but the goal is always to produce anything being published to have audiobooks simultaneous with the other editions, the eBooks, the print, so that everything comes out at once. And part of that is to capture the sales and the marketing and the excitement around it when it first comes out. But it's also because it really is not, um, you can't say that you are publishing accessibly if you do not make it available across all formats at once. Um, there is a huge growth market for audiobooks. Um, it's still developing in Canada. The, the industry is only about four years old here in Canada. Before that, pretty much everything was done uh, in the US, in the UK, um, but it's really becoming a global industry. So we're starting to see a whole lot more of that. Um, and part of that is there are people who prefer to listen to audiobooks or who listen while they're driving is a big one. Taking the TTC was always my favorite. Um, but it also affects people who have disabilities such as um, not just dyslexia or print disabilities, but also people who have physical disabilities who can't physically hold the page. Um, so we work uh, in tandem occasionally with a couple of organizations, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind is sort of the main one that we work with and they convert any existing audiobooks um, into uh, a more accessible format. Um, and they also produce any books that aren't done in audio or as many as they can. So any of the classics or that sort of thing that uh, may not have been touched before audio became an industry, they're going back and doing a lot of those as well. Um, so ideally, your book is going to be produced as an audiobook right off the bat. That is what we aim for. Uh, the next step with that is it, it depends on the material who is going to read it. So if it's something like it's a memoir, then most likely we will have the author read it. If it's a fiction, it's often cast. Um, some of the factors that go into that are uh, like if there's a bunch of different voices or a bunch of accents or characters or something like that, we want somebody who really has a background and training in, if not voice acting, then at least sort of acting. So they can inhabit those characters and it's really clear to the listener because as a listener, you're not able to follow along on the page. So having that clarity is really important. Um, and for this reason as well, we also will occasionally get authors who are not uh, natural speakers, like if, if you speak for a living or a broadcaster, then those are the sort of people who, who are more likely to be shoo-ins for narrating their own book. But we do often have authors audition because sometimes with the material, it is helpful to have a performer narrate it to really lift it off the page and really get those beats for the listener so that they can follow along easily. Um, so if we are doing a casting, what we would do is a producer like myself would read through the book. We would read the whole thing. <laughs> we would have a conversation with the author, talk about how do you imagine the narrator's voice to sound? If it isn't first person, then this is a really important conversation. Um, but that would be any sort of voice qualities. Is it light? Is it warm? Is it kind of cool and aloof? Uh, is there a reference that you would use for the voice like, oh, when I hear her in my head, she really sounds like Emma Stone. That's a really, really clear way to describe to producers like, okay, this is exactly who we're looking for. And this is who kind of fits the bill vocally. Um, from that point, we are going through and we're picking a couple of sides from the book. And those would 
be around 750 to 900 words usually. We pick a couple of those and what we look for is something that has the sort of general narration so we get a sense of them as a storyteller, but also some dialogue ideally so that we really get a sense on if they can make it clear who's talking because if there's no vocal differentiation between the different characters then it's almost impossible to keep track, uh, especially if you don't like to add in the tags of he said or she said at the end of sentences and just have several lines of dialogue. Um, it keeps it interesting for us, uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so, so we send that out. We have a couple of, of sides. Um, we might also include something like if there's medical terminology that's really uh, laced throughout the book, if it's like set at you know Johns Hopkins or something like that, if there's a specific like a maid who keeps coming back with an Irish accent, then we'll want to make sure that someone can do an Irish accent, um, sort of English, Irish, any sort of European accents are ones that actors tend to really think that they can do well. And we don't always agree on that. So that's one of the things that we always say, yes, <laughs> let's see if you can actually do uh, a London accent. We'll put that to the test. Um, so we're working with a casting director who also has a sense of uh, the performers in the city. I thankfully have some of that as well from my theater time, um, but we work with this ca casting director who has a great relationship with the agents as well. Uh, we work with union actors who are signed up with ACTRA. Uh, if there is a special request, then we can put in permit, so that's possible too. But we do have a partnership with the union, which guarantees a set rate for performers. Authors are also paid. They have a, a separate contract that doesn't go through all the extra union paperwork and dues and that sort of thing. Um, but so, so she would send out the brief to the agents, get a bunch of auditions back, which the producer then goes through because they're just getting these clips of the book, the, sn the snippets, the background that we've given them, but they don't have the benefit of talking to a producer or a director or of reading the whole book. So we're listening to it and saying, okay, given the context of how much we're going to see this character or how important this thing that we incorporated into the brief is, any of those sort of things, we're listening to it and going, okay, I feel like based on these factors, these three or four people are a great candidate for this book to narrate it. Um, and that goes then to the author. We would send it to you and say, hey, these are some people who we think are top contenders. We would love your feedback on it. Um, can we get your input? And you would tell us your top pick. Ideally, they are still available and we book them. Um, from there, we go into studio. There's a director who has been prepping this as well, who's been reading the book, following, falling in love with it just as much as we do. Um, and they're asking the absurdly detailed questions of like, where specifically is this place? And is it pronounced Smith or Smythe? And all of those little things that we get your feedback on. So we can make sure that we really create this world as accurately as possible. Um, and from that point, they record it. We usually have for every 9,000 words, it's estimated one finished hour. For every finished hour, we book three hours of studio time. A little bit more if it's really complicated sometimes but so it's really really a marathon it takes a while to record an audiobook um, which is also why we often cast performers because a lot of writers have other jobs too and uh, don't necessarily want to spend 30 hours in a studio um, so we we record all of it it goes to an editor uh, who also does a proofing of it and makes sure that there aren't any added words or dropped words or strange mispronunciations after we get their proofing report back, we do a pickup session and get anything we might be missing or that might need fixing, which could also include, you know, clothing rustles underneath. Hopefully nobody's worn Velcro or corduroy to this studio. Um, but we, it could be somebody bumped the mic under this word or the AC fan came on and they, they didn't catch it quite quickly enough. Um, it could be those things as well. So we get those pickups, they get sent back to the editor, they get cut in. And then it's like another sort of copy edit, uh, QC, quality control, where somebody who is completely fresh to the book, who hasn't edited it, hasn't touched any of the audio, 
they get the clean manuscript and they get the audio of the book and they're listening and reading along and making sure that it's word perfect because if you're the author you get a little bit of leeway you can make con contractions you can do tiny little tweaks that sort of thing but ideally we want it to be word perfect and if it isn't the author we insist because they didn't write it so we do that second QC, we get pickups with anything noted on there. They put that in, they spot check it, and then it gets sent back to us, we archive it, and it gets sent out to vendors, which is ideally four to six weeks before the on-sale date. Um, the start of this process usually happens about three months to the on-sale date, so it's very condensed timelines compared to the rest of publishing, which you could be working with an editor for years and then at the very last minute we swoop in and, and I'd like to think we do the fun bit. Um, but so that's that sort of audiobooks in a nutshell. That's kind of the lifeline of an audiobook. Um, there's sometimes uh, it's sometimes revisited if like a paperback edition comes out and there's a new forward then we might have to go back into studio and add some material. Um, but that's that's really sort of the the start to finish of it um, in a very, very quick nutshell. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sonia. That's really, um, I, I'm impressed at the precision and all of the accuracy and the checks and just going, just all the meticulous details of this. It's really exciting um, to, to hear about that process. It's, and it's also reassuring as, as writers, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> to know that your work is being taken word for word. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so we do have one question uh, for you so far. Please, everyone else, put your questions in the, uh, in the comments and we'll read them. Um, but the first one is from Kieran. Um, if you're not affiliated with a big publisher, which you are, um, but if you're not, what is the best way or the cheapest way or most cost efficient way to go about securing an audiobook contract? Um, is it worth yeah. it if your book doesn't have commercial appeal? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, if it is a small press, a lot of the small presses are kind of, um, actually, I'm not sure if they are now, but they were previously being produced kind of collectively by ECW Press. If it's something where you're self-publishing, it is it is expensive. Um, but there are freelancers who do sort of editing and that sort of thing. All of the directors we work with are freelancers. Uh, I would suggest investing in a director because they are really acting as the outside ear for you. Um, you tend to get, it, it's possible to get tunnel vision a little bit. So they're acting as the outside ear speaking on behalf of the listener saying like, oh, that was a little unclear, unclear, or can you, can you tweak that sort of uh, sentence or paragraph so that we really get the sense or the urgency of this, whatever it might be. So I wouldn't skimp on a director. Um, studios, so studios are sort of where it's a bit complicated because most commercial studios their bread and butter is advertising and advertising will pay the biggest bucks um so even even working with us we don't pay the full advertising price but they they have to prioritize advertising because that's what keeps the studio doors open um so in a self-publishing kind of situation that would probably be pretty cost prohibitive but there are art centers, there are universities, um, there are some community centers that as they are looking at more modern programming perhaps are adding in things like studios and vocal booths. Certainly universities often have them. Um, it is possible to record at home but it sort of depends on your home setup. Like if I lived in the beaches in uh, on a, like a residential street that was one way and had no through traffic, then it's probably going to be quiet enough. If I lived at my old apartment near like Dufferin in college and you hear the street bell dinging and the Portuguese neighbors next door yelling up and down stairs to each other about what they're having, not a great, not a great environment for recording. Um, you're going to get a lot of that sound into it. And audiobooks are so unforgiving with the recording process because 
there's no sound effects or music to cover any of that. So it does make a difference in, in terms of finding that studio, but I think places like universities in particular are really good to look into. Um, and yeah, and art centers as well that do sort of, especially if they have any sort of like multimedia program, a lot of them will have at least like a booth. Um, so that could be an option. And then an editor is, you know, there's lots of freelance editors who would be super happy for the work. Um, and in terms of proofing, even that could be, you know, it could, it could be someone who has um, like a finely tuned ear, who, who's a good active listener, but who hasn't read your book and they can even do the QC. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a trained engineer who does the QC. There are some tech specs required for vendors. Um, I'm not sure how to connect to the vendors in a sub, uh, self-publishing uh, sort of format, but my colleagues said that there are sort of resources online. I mean, everything's on YouTube. Um, so there's apparently some resources about how to make those connections online as well. I love it. Everything's on YouTube, including us. It ah. is. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find out your answers. Okay. I love that. Um, we have another question. What happens if you hire a narrator that doesn't work out once they're in the studio or once they've done a significant amount of recording and what do you do if an author wants to narrate it, but is a poor um so these have both happened and it's oh it just is heartbreaking when either of them happen um in terms of narrators this is partly why we get narrators to audition um because some you know some people just don't have a very active speaking voice it's really a skill that needs to be developed uh in a lot of cases uh, some people are natural born storytellers, their whole family are storytellers and, you know, they read out loud to each other every Sunday evening for three hours and they, they're just fine. But for the majority of us, um, it's, it's really a marathon and it's really tricky. Um, and it's a little bit hard to, to practice. I mean, you can't practice by reading out loud, but once you're in studio, there's really nothing like it. And even professional actors, like there, there is no one on a single book that I have worked on who their first day recording an audiobook did not get their ass kicked. It is a marathon uh, and it is using your voice in a way that we're not used to. It, we usually have conversations. We're not used to just talking for three or four hours straight. So we try to keep that in mind. We do, we are upfront with people about how much uh, of a physical drain it is, uh, of how demanding time-wise it is because sometimes that affects it. But then we do get authors to audition as well if they're interested. And if they're not a great fit, then we, we just try to explain like, um, we're looking for someone who can lift the words off the page a bit more. Like you have this lovely rich world and we'd really like to get someone who can really capture that and make it super clear for the listener. Um, and sometimes it's also just you know, scheduling decides that too, where they really want to read, but they have a full-time day job or are a journalist and are, could be called away any second or, or, or um, all of, all of the different demands on our time. Um, so sometimes that makes the call too. Um, in terms of hiring a narrator that doesn't work out, um, it's very, it's been very, very rare uh, we usually know pretty quickly. It's either when it has happened, it's mostly been somebody has a reading disability that like the agent didn't even necessarily know about. And this is kind of where it gets a little bit tricky because if people edit their auditions, then we don't necessarily get a sense of like how many tries it, it took. And it's fine to mess up in the middle of a sentence and pick it up and like nobody is a flawless reader all the time. Um, but if it's been edited, then it's really hard for us to, to know that like that might be uh, an issue in studio. And in those cases, it's, we ended up recasting just because like they were getting frustrated too, because we have to record it word perfectly. And um, 
like getting the same note over and over and over again, pretty much anyone gets really frustrated by that. So when it's happening that frequently, uh, you know, we've, we've had a conversation with them and with the agent and said like, look, we'll pay you for your time, but we think it would be best to, to recast in this situation. Uh, and that's partly why we ask for authors to rank in order of favorites so that if they're booked on something, yes, but also if, if something comes up, then um, we know who to go to next. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the main reason. The only other reason we would recast is if somebody came in and they were completely unprepared. They hadn't read the book, they hadn't done any prep, um, and were just not just sort of showing up and phoning it in. Um, we really do look for commitment to it. Um, and I mean, there's stories that deserve to be told. So they deserve to be told well. And if uh, someone isn't going to take that seriously, then we'd like to get someone in who will. Okay, I have a few more questions here. Um, lots of interest here. Um, so for new books, I think you did mention this, but I'm not sure. For new books, do you aim for the same launch dates for the audio and the hard copy? Yes. 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 Okay. We we always um, aim for that. We're sometimes foiled by yeah. the world. <laughs> Things do happen. Um, as a producer, how many books do you have in development at one time? Ooh, uh, right now is really busy. Fall is a super busy publishing season, so our summers are wild. Uh, it usually ranges somewhere between seven and twenty to twenty-five books. Uh, right now, I think we have three producers on staff, and I think we each have between like 12 and 25 happening right now. So uh, it gets busy. It gets busy. What a glorious mess. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lots of reading. Lots of reading. Sometimes I'll be reading and be like, oh man, I'm so busy. Maybe I can listen to this as an audio book. And then it's like, oh wait, <laughs> that's why you're reading it so that somebody else can listen to the audio book. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, here's a question about poetry books. Um, Camila says, what about poetry books? I've noticed they are usually narrated by the poets themselves, which makes sense, but do or should they get direction or other oversight on the recording? What about if you're recording your poetry book at home with professional recording equipment? Uh, we do, it is usually the, the, the author reading those um, because they just, no one in in a way that other books uh it's not really the case it's hard for anyone to get the right sort of beats with that um especially if it's something where there could be a couple of different meanings so we do often have the author doing that but we do give them a director because it is it's not as much about um you know, the, the read itself or the emphasis, because they often have a, a really clear idea of what, what they want and how it's supposed to sound. Um, but the director is still watching things like clarity, uh, pacing, and making sure that it's not going too fast. Um, still keeping an eye to make sure that, you know, you're getting all the the words are, oh, we missed this line on the bottom of this page, or, oh, we didn't read the title of that one. Uh, all of those finicky little details, especially the like the titles of each poem or each essay, those are things that can get overlooked really easily. Um, so having a director there is still helpful. It's a much faster process. So it's usually only one or two days in the studio. Um, you could theoretically record at home. And there's, again, on YouTube, there's some great uh, videos you can just search like building a home recording booth or something like that we've had people record you know like under a quilt or or in a blanket lined closet and if it's something like poetry where it's you're not reading a 12-hour novel that's a lot more doable to do at home especially because it's there it's often shorter pieces so you might be able to be like oh there's a streetcar going by one second and then, and then record again after the dinging has stopped. Um, so it, it's definitely possible. Uh, I would say that if you are working with a producer or a publishing house, do send them a sample of you reading a few pages, like a five minute sample, uh, so that they can hear what the sound is like in your home setup, because the worst thing would be if you recorded all of it and sent it in, and then they were like, we need cleaner audio. Um, but yeah, that's, that should definitely be a possibility. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much. We're just about at time. Um, I do have one more question, though, here yeah. that is um, a, a one about identity that I had missed earlier. Um, does Do the uh, authors or characters, um, do, does their identity, like their race, gender, sexuality, etc., come into consideration when casting? Yes. Yes, particularly if we're casting a memoir, um, if it's if it's something that the author has written, but for whatever reason they can't or don't want to read it, uh, and we're looking at casting, then we we do do our absolute best to cast from someone of a similar background, um, and then in terms of fiction as well, it's absolutely front of mind. That's one of the reasons why we read the full book is because we want to get a sense of like, okay, who are the primary voices in this? Who, uh, even if say the narrator is white, if the best friend is indigenous, we're going to be looking at casting someone who is indigenous. Um, same with if there is a character of color, like we, we ideally want to limit the opportunities for white performers to be given, giving voice to uh, characters of other ethnicities or, you know, speaking, like we don't want to cast a white woman to um, read the memoir of a black woman. Like it just, there are some of those um, identity pieces that they, they can't be captured or understood necessarily by a white performer. So that's something we do definitely take in cons into consideration. Um, I think a really great example of it is the book Such a Fun Age, where it's like one of the main characters is white upper crust woman, but the main sort of narrator, the main person we're following is a young black woman. And of course, it, it's, it is thankfully read by a, a young black woman, but you know, you don't want to have a 36 year old white woman from Toronto trying to voice this girl and all of her friends getting ready for the club. It's just going to be painful and cringe to it. Um, yeah, and same goes for, for accents. You know, we ideally try to cast someone who can uh, as authentically as possible do the accent or who grew up around it. So has a sense of what it should sound like versus somebody who's watched a video about how to do a fill in the blank accent. Uh, and, and, you know, it might sound, it might sound totally passable to my ears, but um, it, it wants to feel true to the author as well and to anyone listening who is from that background so that they don't feel that sort of erasure. So yeah, it's, it's very important. Fantastic, thank you so much. I see some other questions have come in but we don't have time to address them right now. So what I'll do is I'll send, me, send them to you by email. Yeah, please and do. we always um, post your, your uh, a sort of summation at the end of this on our blog. So um, we'll maybe get you to answer those questions on the blog this time. Absolutely. All right. All right, well, thank you very much, Sonia. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Usually at this point, we would hand around a picture for pay what you can donations to help support Brockton and our writers. But passing a picture is a pandemic no-no. Uh, I can't reach through the screen and hand you the picture. So we have a PayPal account. Please go to paypal.me slash Brockton Writers, and we'll make sure to drop this in the comments as well. Um, and if you are able to spare a few dollars for our brilliant writers, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, we value your opinion too. Uh, so we'd like you to take our survey and suggest topics for future guest speakers, amongst other things. Uh, we'll drop the link to the survey in the chat as well. We want to hear from you. And now for our readers. Uh, again, please type questions into the chat as they occur to you as there is a bit of a delay. Uh, we'll also be posting the link to the text in the comments. Um, oh no, that's for later, sorry. Um, so Prakash Krishnan, Prakash Krishnan is an artist researcher and cultural worker based in Montreal. He writes and publishes primarily in the genres of contemporary art and media criticism, but occasionally forays into comedy and personal essay. He dabbles also in film, audio, and performance, and is the co-host of the weekly anti-colonial podcast, Do the Kids Know?
<laughs> is that my cue? Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dorian, for the introduction and for Brockton and Ephemera for having me. Um, so yeah, so like Dorian mentioned, I usually publish very um, experimentally artistic or academic text, which is very jargony and definitely meant to be read and not listened to, especially I think in my voice where I have difficulty pronouncing the words that I write. So instead I thought I would share um, a personal comedic-ish essay uh, that I wrote a few years ago. And just a heads up that it does include um, a homophobic slur, which I say one time and then uh, not again. So yeah, this is um, Bootleg, Eat, Pray, Love. Ziomara knocks on the door and announces she's ready. I offer her my hand and lead her to the makeshift bed, which is really just a concrete slab with some bed sheets and a pillow. She squeezes my hand, her grip tightening then loosening with the ebbs and flows of each contraction. The nurse calls me to join him at the end of the bed and I can see the head crowning. He directs me to push against the perineum and before I know it, there is a brand new, fresh out of the oven baby in my arms. I swaddled the newborn in a blanket before resting her gently on top of Yomara's chest. I feel like I'm having an out of body experience. This is such a surreal moment. I just pulled a baby out of a person I just met 8,000 miles from home. And you're probably wondering what kind of sequence of ridiculous events led up to this. Well, turn back the clocks four months and I'm out on the town with my coworkers. Somehow over the course of the night, celebratory drinks devolve into celebratory lines of Coke. And I wind up alone with John back at his apartment, sitting on a mattress, which is on the floor. Despite the lack of a bed frame in our year of working together, I'd slowly developed a small crush on John. Unlike the rest of our white, straight, dude bro cohort of radiation technicians, John seemed sensitive and nice, and he actually spoke to me. Okay, I know my bar is extremely low, but pickings in my town are slim, and my self-esteem, like my bar, is low to the point of non-existent. So it's 3 a.m., we're sitting on his floor mattress, drunk, high, and tossing a football back and forth because I guess that's what bros do. Meanwhile, his roommates are loudly continuing the party in the living room. And I'm struggling on two fronts. One, I'm thinking about whether or not I should make a move because he hasn't made one. But then again, I'm like, why did he ask me here if he didn't want to? And two, my general aversion to sports is making it difficult for me to maintain this game of intoxicated catch. I can't tell how much time has passed, but the ruckus outside seems to have quelled. I throw the ball to John one last time and gather up my last few remaining brain cells to leave. As I move to get up, John grabs my arm and says to wait. I think you're so interesting and brave and different, he says. I've never been with a fag like you before. The surprising F-bomb throws me for a loop, but it doesn't sound malicious like when men would yell at me in the streets when I'd walk home late after a shift. He proceeds to kiss me and it wasn't violent or forceful, but either it's the drugs or the shock or the sleep deprivation, but my mind leaves my body. When I come to, I'm lying on the mattress next to John He's asleep and I take this opportunity to sneak out and make my way home. I don't know if it's a trauma response or something else diagnosable by wellness Twitter, but I tend to disassociate a lot, usually when it comes to being confronted with my own queerness, which feels odd considering that I've just turned 23 and I've been out-ish for almost 10 years. See, I had had my, com my grand coming out moment on a random weekday when I walked into my grade nine science class and this girl turned to me and asked, hey, you're bi, right? Not knowing what my deal was, but knowing that there was something going on that distinguished me from, it, from the other guys in my class, I replied with a nonchalant, uh-huh, and that was that. My extremely anticlimactic coming out story. 
Yet, even after all this time supposedly out of the closet, I feel incredibly uncomfortable being clocked as queer, and even the sound of my own voice recordings, let alone street harassment, make me want to astrally project from my own body. The next day at work, I'm hiding in my lab to avoid John and decide to do a little research. It's not just because of him, but I need to get out of here. I've come to a sort of crossroads in my life. My work contract is ending and I'm having serious doubts about where I'm going in life. I feel like I'm meant for more than a lifetime of testing nuclear waste and testing my coworkers' urine for radioactive contaminants. So on a whim, I book some plane tickets and in a few weeks, I depart for my own bootleg eat, pray, love journey that was majority eating, if I'm being honest. After two months of solo traveling around Australia and New Zealand, I take a rest stop and visit my extended family in Malaysia for a few weeks. Debating where to go next, they suggest visiting Bali so I can add some prayer to my eating and loving. I book a flight, but the next day a volcano erupts, so instead I head off in the opposite direction and sign up to do a month-long public health internship in the Philippines to embellish my degree in health physics and with the hope that maybe I'll gain some experience and perspective to determine where I want my career to go upon returning to Toronto. Three months after leaving home, I arrive in Bogo City, where I'll be living and volunteering for the next four weeks. There are about a dozen other interns, and to my surprise, I'm the oldest. Most are European high school students and aspiring doctors, including the two British teens I'm sharing a homestay with. I can't help but feel a twinge of jealousy at these kids with rich parents who can afford to send them across the world to test out possible careers before even going to college. And despite being relatively young myself, my life and my upbringing could not have been more different from theirs. Thrown off by the age and wealth gap between us, I began to worry about what I'd signed myself up for. After what I feel was too brief of instrumentation and injection training, we set up screening stations in a rural village to test the locals' glucose, cholesterol, and blood pressure in order to scope out any potential cardiovascular risks. I suck at testing blood sugar. The villagers' fingers are so calloused by decades of physical labor, it sometimes takes multiple tries before I'm able to draw blood, and I feel so incompetent. Also, very few of them spoke English, which looking back is obvious, considering we were in the rural Philippines and most didn't have an education past the fourth grade. And I was like, what the hell am I doing here? Somebody help me, I need an adult. Looking around, I realized that I am the adult and with some additional practice, I luckily start to figure it out. As we approach the long weekend, the other volunteers invite me to join them on a trip to the island of Bohol. I very quickly default to vacation dad making sure people knew our meeting points, had their phones charged and alarm set. And after a day of hiking, zip lining, seeing tiny monkeys and swimming in the ocean, I was ready to take a load off and hit the bar. Considering no one checked ID and drinks are, cheaps, drinks are cheap, things got real sloppy real fast. Someone suggests playing Never Have I Ever, a game in which for every action you have done, you take a drink and lose a finger. Never have I ever stolen. Never have I ever had a same-sex experience. Never have I ever cheated on someone. I lose the game quickly, and with the drop of each finger, I'm asked for the accompanying story. Whether it was the alcohol or the earnest looks on these kids' faces, or the fact that I'll never see them again, I start to divulge my most well-kept tales of debauchery, including stealing my mom's car, uh, and then also getting with and then cheating on my first boyfriend with his best friend. I saw in their eyes that my life and queerness didn't mark me as some kind of freak like I'd feared, but it maybe even made them like and respect me more. And most surprisingly for me, I didn't disassociate once. Over the next few weeks, I continued to alternate between health screenings, nutritional workshops, hospital visits, and bonding time with my new friends. As the summer came to a close, the other volunteers began returning to their respective home countries, promising to keep in touch. Before leaving for England, one of my roommates told me that there's literally no one like me back home, 
and that he's gonna feel so lost without my constant presence and support. The other confesses that he is not sure if he's as straight as he assumed, and that he's afraid of what that means when he returns to his religious family. Bags by the front door, I hug them tight, realizing that despite our differences in age or upbringing, we were all in the same boat, just trying to figure out life one step at a time. Before leaving Canada, I thought I had it all figured out. I was on track to become a nuclear engineer, have a nuclear family, and be the model child for my parents. But now here I am halfway across the world, just having helped deliver a baby. If this isn't a sign of turning over a new leaf, I don't know what is. In the end, it wasn't the eat, pray, love fantasy I had envisioned. Oops. Uh, yet I felt like it was the one I needed. If I can be my best self here, among strangers on a remote island, I can be it anywhere. And for the first time, I'm so excited to show myself off. See you soon, world. Thank you. Oh, that was cool. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prakash. Um, and thanks to the, the very um, pointed falling of the picture in the background. That was pretty dramatic. Um, I especially like the diagnosable by wellness Twitter. That was hilarious. Um, <laughs> thanks very much for that. Next up, we have Camila Rina. Camila Rina is an autistic and multi-disabled immigrant Jewish non-binary by demi-ace poet and a sexuality gender disability educator living in Treaty 13 territory. They have been published internationally, including in Room Magazine, Breath and Shadow, Monstering, Deaf Poet Society, We Have Come Far, Carousel, Augur, Frond, Mary, and Queer Out There. Camila, welcome. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Um, I wrote this first piece um, some years ago, but it seems super relevant um, right now. Um, I do wanna offer a content note. It mentions sexual assault and genocide with some details. Um, also a little context, I was born and grew up some in communist Poland. Um, and this piece starts there. It's called The Gift. To be a Jew in the 20th century is to be offered a gift from Letters to the Front by Muriel Rukeyser. To be a Jew when I was small and soft and curled as a muscle was torment, rented to pious rapists for Easter or Christmas, tied to a bed for hours, my tongue thick in my mouth, my body torn and stained, rage running into me, viscous like semen. It was the weight of history. My grandmother telling me of running from the Nazis, our class trips to the concentration camps, the ruins still squatting on our soil, unforgettable chimney stacks aimed at the sky. These told me what I already knew. We are weak and our lives are full of peril. It was secrets and shame. When I was six, my mother said, we're Jewish, don't tell anyone. And I didn't. Our government expediently hated our kind, used us as scapegoats to quash dissent, then denied us schooling or jobs, capriciously took away our papers and put us on one-way trains out. It was vulnerability. The pious and fearful murdered us in pogroms. The last one, the year my mother was born, in mid-20th century. Some of us who stayed silent, camouflaged, kept our heads down, went unnoticed, unexpelled, stayed alive. But we survived ashamed, curled up and small. And I thought that's what being a Jew meant. The best we could hope for was to be passed over. I failed to notice the others who, enraged, dangerously light, shorn of family and security, had decided to change the story to stop or erase the pogroms, the smokestacks, the desk ghettos, university expulsions, firings, the long toothed centuries of repression and humiliation, shame and helplessness eating us from the inside like apple worms, the lack of safe refuge, the world turning us away from its doors when we knocked, desperate, hands shaking, death breathing down our necks. As our world does, 
time and again when the desperate, the death marked, come knocking. So the dangerous one said, never again. And it sounded like a promise. They took a country, first one half, then the other, so we could be safe. They took lives, first from fighters on both sides, then from people on their way to work, families eating dinner, school children, so we could be safe. They got more and better weapons. They used them sloppily. When their rocket hit a school, killed the students, international law said it wasn't a war crime, just bad aim. When they ghettoized the nation, allowed corporations to work the hungry in sweatshops, destroyed homes, built a wall, installed checkpoints at exits, randomly killed without sanction, they said, we said, they were trying to stay safe. Those exiles were dangerous, terrorist. Why does that sound like that other story, the one we'd already lived through, the one they tried to rub out like a stain? Is this always how bullies are made? The fearful, desperate, shamed, snatch power or steal it, reconcile their souls to evil, first small, then large scale, then genocidal? How can we find safety without stealing it from others, without turning into what we despise? To be a Jew in the 21st century is to have questions, heartache, guilt, defensiveness, a clenched jaw. Maybe that is our gift. So this next piece, um, I wrote in response to a poem we read in my poetry class. The class itself was quite lovely overall. Um, but it was painful to listen to this piece that talked about the author's autistic son. It honestly dismissed and devalued our lives um, painfully and thoughtlessly. And this is my response. It's called, I am a goddamn miracle. As an infant, I was a disappointment to my mother, spitting up formula all over the walls, crying loudly late into the night, not contacting eyes not wanting to be touched. A disappointment that grooved into her heart, maybe left a small scar. I was a fantastic spotter, a pointer, an explorer, a precise science mind, offspring of two such minds. You'd think she would have been pleased. All she could see was the delicate blue coils of the walnut in my small skull, too strange, embarrassing, and so rejectable. I lived so much joy tried to bring her broody chickens half my size to hug, tugged on her skirt or hair to share everything that marveled me. She only saw vexation, the way I'd let her down, the failure she read into my as yet furled life. And I wanted to end with this piece, um, which is about surviving a hard time, which we've all been having lately. <laughs> Um, I honestly think it's kind of optimistic, despite the fact that it talks a lot about suffering. It's called You Will. It will startle you again and again until you get used to it. And maybe you never will. How the thick center of suffering, the pitchy, hot, clenched eye of it, sleepless, harsh, merciless, that has stayed with you, pushing on your chest, watching the muscles their knot into rough hemp ropes, stayed fixed unblinking on the motion of your heart, causing it to alternately skitter and tread heavily like an elephant, awash in fear and uncertainty under that threatening gaze, will throw itself open, will part for sudden moments of joy. You thought you'd never be happy again. Thought this not in hyperbole or self-important grandeur, but because you saw you'd forgotten how, missed the trick of it, living in the heavy, fiery eye, following the erratic, defeated beat of your heart as it slowly dried up, curled smaller and flimsier, pushing your lungs to breathe, at times such physical work, forcing the creaky stretch of your ribcage, the reluctant lift of your sternum, the slow inflation of your abdomen, taught you nothing but the road of endurance. Not heroic and large as in the movies where the sweat and dirt are carefully applied out of the bottle, 
or as in novels where narration obliviously rushes through pronouncements like unbearable or felt like dying. But your own small, pathetic, uneven endurance, hatched and force grown in your muscles, lungs, face, tear ducts, so obviously unequal to the task at hand, surviving your suffering. So you go mad. We all do. There's no living through pain without insanity. We are not built for these temperatures. Your edges crisp, flake, curl up. You develop unexpected blank spots or entire eraser wiped swaths, unreasonable new connections which snake past what you know or believe, which feed on pain like on radioactive milk and tumor like grow out of control. The sear of the pain makes you choke and get blotchy red in public. You find it lacerating you inside, quietly wringing your organs when you're alone. It feels as if it will never go away. It has forced to new, a warped new world with itself, the never sleeping eye at its center. And you live with it, not because you're brave, but because there's no living without it and you are not ready to die. Because people need you even broken as you are, or because you hope for a change, as something good, a break in the pain eyes vigilance. And one day it comes, so unexpectedly you don't know how to take it, how to taste it, as if your hands and taste buds have gone missing. The opaque pupil willingly unclenches, quietly opens to let in a moment of joy. It bursts in on you without warning without protection, and often stings your eyes, ears, or your mouth, so wildly it dances through your now delicate, paler, dried up tissues. A moment in which you taste a ripe purple summer cherry or see a wide sherbet sunset, read a funny line, watch a squirrel chase its tail up a tree. And yes, the joy hurts. Your new world is not made to easily hold it and you scrape a little in the process. But oh, feel too your heart slosh wildly in that instant, filled over its brim. Feel your toes curl and uncurl a little awkwardly as if trying something quite new. Feel your lungs balloon until your ribs ache without you pushing, forcing the air. Feel your cheek muscles stretch past comfort as you smile, smile, smile. Catch yourself hearing, what a wonderful world. When the moment ends, as inevitably it will, and you will be returned to suffering as before, but now with the knowledge of a different world, whole and green and tender, of a different you you were able to touch, to be for an instant, body present, sparkling, that offered you imaginings, wild hopings you long to see burst into stalks and flowers like tulips you might put into the earth in autumn in another life where faith and hope are easy and common like soil. You will be bereft. You'll want to feel it again. And you will. I promise that it will startle you over and over again. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, yeah, wonderful. Next, we have Kiran Bhatt. As a global citizen formed in a suburb of Atlanta to parents from Southern Karnataka in India, he has traveled to over 130 countries, lived in 18 different places, and speaks 12 languages. He's primarily known as the author of We of the Forsaken World from Iguana Books in 2020 but he has authored books in four foreign languages and has his writing published in the Kenyan Review, the Brooklyn Rail, 3AM Magazine, and several other places. His list of homes is vast, but his heart and spirit always remain in Mumbai somehow. He is currently traveling around Mexico. Kiran? Hello, everyone. It's a wonder to meet you all digitally. As um, Dorian said, <laughs> I've lived a very different life from most people in Canada. <laughs> That's just how it is. Ever since I was 18, I've been just living almost every year in another country. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because I really wanted to have this capacity to have a deep and kind of nuanced understanding of different cultures across the planet. I didn't just want to be someone who was superficially traveling. I wanted to be someone who was able to try to connect a little bit linguistically, socially, culturally with different landscapes. And it came from me through a small little trip I took in Spain, where I had this little vision in my head where I wanted to write a book that could encapsulate the planet. You know, I wanted to write something that belonged to planet Earth. 
I want to be a global writer. I didn't want to be someone who was just of one condition. I want to belong to the earth and in a way that wasn't just superficial. So traveled I have, learned many languages I have, and now I'm working on a project called Hirar. Hirar is the Spanish word for uh, turning, to turn. I, I'm now going to share my screen just to show a little bit. I do have to precaution you that uh, what I'm showing is just a draft. <laughs> I'm going to be redeveloping the page. I'm getting the page redeveloped by a, another person and it'll relaunch in August. So at that point, I think some of the images will stay the same, but it'll work a little better. But um, the point is, is that I wanted to create a novel that was a digital experiment that belonged to a digital tapestry rather than just a typical book. And so Hirar aspires to write a story taking place in 365 different places on the planet from this year to the end of 2029. It's supposed to be kind of a live diary of life on this earth for 10 years. And um, the way uh, it works is if you choose to sign up, you get a certain amount of stories for free. And then you, after a certain point, stop getting free stories and you have to pay about a dollar a month to continue your subscription. And then you get the whole thing. And so if you sign up, you get stories on the day that they're published. So if I, if I decide to publish a story today uh, set in Chiapas where I'm staying, you will get it even if you're in Zimbabwe, even if you're in Canada, even if you're in Turkmenistan at 6.30 right now, which is the time here. And it does that over the course of a decade. So you keep getting stories over and over again for about a 10 year period set all across the globe. The way the stories work, I'm going to stop sharing now and share again in a second. Um, there's a mother, father, and son character. And those three characters are just reimagined in different cultural contexts. I see the mother as kind of a somewhat religious, uh, dogmatic person. <laughs> and I think the introduction to the novel does a, a good job in showing that. So this is a little section set in Mysore, which is one of my native places in Karnataka in India. Today was Yugadi, the Kannada New Year. It was a day to dine on the sweetest of jaggeries, a day to decorate one's door with neem and mango leaves. It was a day to paint the porch with rangoli patterns and stench the halls with incense. It was a day of importance for anyone who was a Kanadaga. For mother, it was a day to pray. Frankly, be it a festival, an auspicious occasion or a public related holiday, mother took any Indian day of importance quite seriously. She would spend all day watching the patriotic news programs on Republic Day, just as she would visit her native place of Kodagu to observe Dasara, Deepavali, or any birthday of a god. The, COVID, uh, the coronavirus had changed much in India, but it did not change mother's convictions. And so there mother was, sitting cross-legged against her gate, painting rangolis and waiting for the archika to come. Father had left for the hospital around midnight, so mother was alone. She was taking care so that the wind would not blow away the powder. It was five in the morning, an hour of the day late enough to be considered still night, but early enough to be considered dawn. Just a few days ago, this modest bungalow of her stood beside an empty grass yard in which cows rested and dogs played, or an opportunistic Pani Puri vendor set up his stall, where the land was purchased and developed into a modern apartment complex and was now populated with students. The students did not care about anything. Most of them did not even come from Karnataka. They had that North Indian rowdiness. They would play loud music whenever they felt like it, swear loudly in Hindi and shame themselves in public, even at these odd hours. The locals of this humble street of Kuempanaga were all of retirement age and could not abide the noise. And it goes on. <laughs> uh, that's one of the stories set in Karnataka. And uh, that I think in a short space does a decent job of showing the type of person mother is fastidious, uh, deeply concerned with detail and someone who pays attention to religion. Father, in the meantime, is a person who's more practical. He's a humble hospital doctor. But when we go into father's mind, we will not be in Karnataka anymore. We are now going to be in the unique space of Hainan, which is in China. And I'm going to skip a little bit. Uh, no matter how serious his patient's cases were, father could not help but dwell on son's rash decision to return home. When he had talked to son on the phone the day before, there had been nothing of warmth in his voice. He had been arrogant and self-assuming. I know you're lonely. A good son takes care of his old parents. It was his son when negotiating a business deal. Father should have told son no. Even a decade ago, before his son left, the world was saying that the future belonged to China. All of the well-paying jobs were here and all the opportunities were here too. His son really thought so little about his parents and he wouldn't have left in the first place. And he certainly would not have done so with such a dramatic exit. But son had lost his job. So son was going to lose his right to a visa. What other choice did he have other than to return home? Father thought in a logical way 99% of the time, but in that off 1% when he was swayed by emotion, it was akin to the way hurricanes destroyed the roots of trees. I'll buy your ticket, come quickly was what he had sent to son and buy that ticket was what he'd done, even after son had hung up instantaneously. 
While father was taking care of a patient earlier that day, he'd gotten so lost to imagining his conversation with son that right in the middle of developing a diagnosis, he'd stared out of a window directly into the sun as if he were waiting, just waiting for the moment when the rays would blind him. So this section takes place in China, in Hainan. And it, it does a job not only, I think, of showing a little bit of the type of personality or temperament that father has, kind of more to the point. I think it also sets up one of the major cruxes of Vera, which is this mother father who are dealing with a son who's lived abroad for 10 years, who they don't understand. And this is not said yet, but is gay. They have had to spend a decade uh, being away from them and they just don't understand his mentality. So I think a lot of the stories kind of deal with that type of absence or that type of inability to understand that difference. And I also think that um, the uh, stories pivot through that kind of conflict, particularly in the first sections. Oh, that's the Hainan story again. Let me just get rid of that. <laughs> I think in certain ways, one thing about this reimagining and this kind of disimagining is it allows me to also kind of play with different cultures and their ways of looking at it. So mother, father and son have not had a very easy life because of his being gay. <laughs> um, and also one thing that you'll see here is um, when the story is a little bit um, like it's this one is set in Mauritania. So I changed the punctuation to fit Arabic, not English. Uh, this is mother after son has returned home. They have a little bit of a talk and um, son recalls the way that he was treated by his parents, which was not very good. I'm going to skip a little bit because I only have three minutes left. But uh, despite that, mother still has a resolve. Without realizing it, mother was standing. Not noticing her feet move, she had gone somewhere in between from where she had sat and where son's chair was. The leftover glasses and teapots and trays on the market with uh, carpet were clinking because of the strength of her footsteps. So strong that the biscuits that were packed in their containers were slinking out and crumbling. And then, you know, they, um, she noticed a mess and became mildly self-conscious about it. She remembered she had said something, but she had already forgotten what it was. All she could notice was the look in son's eyes. They flickered with so much emotion and so much hurt. And uh, then there's more <laughs> to express, but I, I only have a little bit of time. So I think I'll keep that in mind. Uh, the point is that I think each of these stories tell a little bit of the greater piece of this greater kind of cosmic world, uh, literally the cosmic world, because there's, it's set in so many different places uh, like Mauritania, China, India but uh, also it tells a little bit of a greater piece of this story. And so I'm hoping that with this kind of uh, piecemeal effort, I'm kind of slowly giving a little bit of not only the life of these people, but a little bit of a short story in all the different cultures that I've chosen to inhabit in this project and to render it in a way that I think, you know, globalization pushes us into different corners of the world every day. So I wanted to kind of render that in a type of literary artifact. So this is my attempt at that. So. If anyone's interested, um, please consider, at least for now, signing up. I mean, once it's properly developed, it'll look different, but um, sign up if you're interested in the project and then uh, subscribe if it's of interest to you later. And um, I think I'll leave it for now uh, at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Kieran. It was, that was really neat to hear the different thoughts of, of the different perspectives um, of a family from in different spaces in the world and in different spaces in their minds, obviously too. And, and, uh, and that's, it's a, it's a really cool project. It's a really neat um, way of, of telling a story um, over space and over time. So next we have Carrie-Anne Leung is a fiction writer and educator. Her debut novel, the Wondrous Wu was shortlisted for the 2014 Toronto Book Awards. Her collection of linked stories, That Time I Loved You, was named one of the best books of 2018 by CBC, shortlisted for the Toronto Book Awards 2019, longlisted for Canada Reads 2019, and awarded the Danuta Gleed Literary Award in 2019. She is currently working on a new novel titled The After. Carrie Ann, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to my fellow uh, writers and poets for sharing the space. Um, instead of fiction tonight, I think I'm going to read an essay, a personal essay uh, that's forthcoming from Coach House Press. It's called Tongues on Longing and Belonging Through Language, edited by Ayelet Subari, Euphemia Vincetti, and Leonardo Carranza. I'm really excited about this anthology and it'll be I think launched this fall. Um, so I will read my essay in it called The Reach. 
Language to me has always been about reaching. I have never belonged in language. There have been moments when I have found refuge, but language is a shifting ground, a churning sea, and never a place for me to land. My maternal grandmother was also a writer. She wrote serial love stories under a pseudonym that were in syndicated newspapers in the 1930s and 1940s in Hong Kong. No one in my family knows much about this part of her life or seems to care, even as I find it extraordinary. When she was already old and I was a child, I would file her nails and inhale her, the smoke from her menthol cigarettes, the camphor of white flower oil, and the talcum powder she liberally sprinkled on her skin after a bath. I remember these small gestures, these small moments, these small silences. She was a woman trapped in a Scarborough house in the late 70s, captive to a foreign language she didn't understand and white faces that did not give a damn about her. But at night, I was at her side. When I was five years old, I immigrated with my family from Hong Kong to Canada. My ability to speak Cantonese was interrupted, my tongue arrested and frozen in childhood. My parents, both fluent in English and wanting me and my brother to master it, didn't enforce Cantonese at home. We settled on the Chinglish so familiar in other diasporic households. I never learned how to write or read, and so this was the first loss. Years later, as a young adult, I would return to Hong Kong to live, and I fumbled to find words again. While my face allowed me entry to an optics of belonging, my capacity to express myself in Cantonese betrayed me every time. My stuttering tongue, the long pauses in conversations as I tried frantically to search for the right word or phrase in my head, my tones always a bit off when I got nervous, and that childlike vocabulary always raised the flag that I might not be what I seemed. These were the telltale signs of a profound loss. And in the three years I lived there, Cantonese would always be a hard stretch, but one infused with joy when I found a connection with the right word, the right time, and the right person. It's a colorful language, full of vernacular, rich with vocabulary. I would sometimes find a place to sit. It could be a mall or a park or a street market, and I would close my eyes and get lost in the sounds of the language around me and be soothed. Language is more than words, syntax, meaning. It is reverberation. It is energy. It is visceral. As a child immigrant, while Cantonese receded from my life in Canada, I found English, and I also found silence. To me, English and silence are interwoven because I learned them at the same time. My life was divided between Hong Kong and life after Hong Kong. Immigration cleaved and transformed me. I went from a chatty rascal of a child to a silent and still one. At an event recently, I was asked what I was like as a child, and I replied that I was silent. I became the quintessential quiet Chinese girl, the one who became invisible, blended into the background, docile, easily managed. I figured out quickly that I did not belong, that no one looked like me, played like me, or sounded like me. When I watched that Sesame Street skit, one of these things is not like the other, I understood that this was me. I was not like the others, and everybody else knew it too. But then my silence grew into something else, something rich and thick and full of nuance. Silence floated around me, and I could easily pluck at it and shape it, disappear into the place inside where Cantonese was fading and English was flooding in. Silence was where things formed in between language and contained all my wanting, my fears. It could hold all the things I could not quite name. What was happening to me, my loneliness, the splendor of what I saw too. Silence did not let me down. As a writer, I chase after silence and try to capture it in words, knowing I will always fail. I do it anyway because it's the silence that everything I want lives. I learned English because I discovered books as a kid. I had been too young to acquire literacy in Chinese, so English was where I discovered the written word. I owe a great debt to Jean Little. My school library carried her books, and these books became friends. They did not require me to speak, but only to listen. Little found a way to put the plain and loneliness of children into language and offered me vocabulary to connect my own experience. There is such spaciousness offered when a reader connects with a writer through the word, 
And from then on, I saw possibility. I still grab at the possibility of language, but I know there will never, I will never be a master over it. I suppose I have gained some accomplishments. I have written a PhD dissertation, two books of fiction, various academic and personal essays. I have fluency, but fluency only means I have mastered a level of syntax, a mode of address, communities of lexicon. There are times when I am called to speak or write and I still stutter, I still stumble. This comes from knowing that I work in a language that, and discourse will I, where I will always need to reach. When I reflect on writer's block, I discover that it is a reach back into silence. I lost a language I was born to inherit. Simultaneously, I acquired a language that was not for me, but that I learned to bend into shape that suited me. But mostly I dwell in silence, a secret language that is misaligned and mistaken for complacency, void, inaction. I'm sorry about that siren. Silence is and has functioned as an active historical practice against BIPOC bodies. Silence has a lineage, if you will. Silence is also its own language. So you see, silence is many things, both our oppressor and our craft. This is the tricky thing about writing in a colonizer's language. I also know the act of finding language to speak comes with a labor of pulling from blood and bone. Writing is my insistence. But sometimes, even when I'm unable to break the surface and come up with the words, it is not enough. As Dionne Brand reminds us in the title of her book of poetry, No Language is Neutral. The terms of engagement can also erase all that I try to make. I spend a lot of time trying to find language. The words need to be exact and yet open, dynamic and yet heavy. They have to be sharp like points of arrows and beautiful too, like sparks of light on a lake. But sometimes it's not the words nor their careful craft arranged precisely in intricate patterns. Sometimes it's not the words that are at fault for why they don't land where and how they should. It's up to the reader to reach too. And at times the reader will simply not let the words pierce and settle. This is, what, this is often what confronts BIPOC writers. We know the enormity of what we are up against. The readers are sometimes locked in their own world of mythology. This narrative that arrives from my body may already be at odds with the reader's mythology. Knowing the stakes, I love words too much to, to declare them my enemy and so I reach. My practice as a writer is simple. Make the space, make it large with intention and care. Braid all our languages together, articulate a new world. What choice do I have? My grandmother died on my 30th birthday. I had read somewhere that Confucius says at age 30, one must take a stand. I knew my grandmother was sending me a message, the most important one. And so this gold thread is what knits my spine together. And she is also what I reach for when I write my stories. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie Ann. So it's great to hear your, um, your creative nonfiction as well. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to hear that. Um, and, and I love the idea of, of silence as, as a location um, and, and reaching into it and, and the relationship with it too. Um, it's, it's a really, really beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so next we have a Q&A. Um, so thanks everyone for listening to our readers and please enter your questions into the comments and we'll read them from there. Um, if you have a, a question now, please enter it. Um, please note that we'll only read questions that are respectful of our authors and their work and that do not promote any sort of oppression. Um, so let's see. Okay. So, um, so we don't have any questions just yet. So as you're thinking of some questions, um, I, I have some, some ones prepared for our, for our writers here. Um, I actually because have a question. Oh, okay. Please go ahead. Mine are uh, just back pocket. I, mean, I don't know if I have it formed because it just kind of came to me as, as Carrie was reading um, about, because it's about language, right? About um, coming to reading and writing 
as English because uh, not having the Cantonese later in life. And so for people who speak multiple languages, like for Kiran, I don't know if others read, like, do you write in different languages? And if so, how do the different languages like inform how you write? Right, like if you write something in English, but you're gonna write the same thing in a different language, does it come out different? I would think it must, that you can't write the very same thing. The, the language somehow um, has something to do with it. Uh, am I allowed to consider answering it or should Kay? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, you're the one who speaks 12 languages. <laughs> How many of them do you write But it was the best to first, so I was not sure. <laughs> yeah. So I am an interesting place to consider this question. I've thought about this a lot because right now I'm in Mexico translating. So it's something that I have to think about literally all the time. Uh, as a writer, I try to work in about six of the languages I happen to know, uh, English, Kannada, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, and Turkish, to varying levels of success. I don't see it as an element of success because I'm a foreigner in most of them. And it's mostly for fun, I'd say. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to hear from Camila as well. <laughs> but um. From the perspective of what you're talking about, it's very important when we translate because you realize when you work deeply in a certain language that languages exist in their code. And each time that I have to kind of reimagine or re rework through my uh, different, whatever this, say this project or that, I feel like I have to strip the language away, look at the essence and then rebuild up. So it's not like translating word from when I do this as well, when I write, I don't uh, just, um, think in English, I just switch to the other language and start again, you know, and I don't try to keep it the same because you can't, each language is different and has different ways of positing themselves in the world. So I just, uh, I try, and I think that's the best way to look at it. Even if you don't know much of the language, it's better to start from that base level, start at the beginning of the code and use what very little of the language you know to then, you know, kind of build your world. But if you just try to translate word to word, it will not be a success. It'll have no life, it, it, it feels dead, so. I'd recommend that. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, this is a great question. Um, and I've, I have a similar experience as uh, Kiran um, that um, I, I speak seven languages to with various fluencies. Um, I'm super fluent in two and somewhere in an intermediate level um, at another two, like I can carry on um, conversations and understand what people say to me. And I guess I'm an advanced beginner in the others. Um, but even the ones where I'm an advanced beginner, I find um, how the language is constructed matters a lot um, to um, what you can say with it and what it encourages you to say and the kinds of things that it encourages you to dwell on. So I'm trying to, um, this is like a new project that I'm working on to work more words from other languages into my writing um, and to do it in ways that make sense with the original language. And so usually, um, yeah, I will start from what the phrase is like in its um, original language and then try to translate um, um, and fit it in that way as opposed to trying to translate into another language. Um, I find that um, some poems come to me in other languages already or, um, or parts of them. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what to do with that because the language they arrive in first is, is originally, I guess, what, um, how they perform best, how they appear to their best advantage, but sometimes there's not necessarily a lot of audience for it. Um, so I will usually translate in some way, but try to preserve the spirit of the original, especially the, the grammar and what the grammar encourages or allows you to say um, of other languages, I find is a really big contributor to what um, the poem can do. Thank you so much for that. I don't know if anybody else has things to say before we move on to Emily's question. Okay, so so departing from specifically the language part of it, um, what what does we're all at very differing spots in our in our literary careers, um, and uh, I, I I hope it's not true, but I think that sometimes um, some punishing self reflection is is part of being a writer. 
Um, but what is the idea? What is your next idea of success? What what is what do you consider success as a writer? Um, what is what is what is on your horizon? Should I, I can answer that? Maybe I'll try. Um, I I don't success for me is just. It's like that question of what audience are you writing for, right? And I always write for myself first. And that may sound like I don't care about readers, but I, I find that for me, the success is writing something that um, feels like I've made something alive, you know? Um, and I really, you know, I, when I hear, um, if I have students, in my classes of creative writing. And when they suddenly say, oh my God, writing is so hard. It is hard, right? And I think that the, the struggle for me, and as I say in that essay, the reach for me is, is what makes it so precious. And so when I have, when I work through that, that to me is the success that I'm still here and I'm still reaching. Um, the process has always been um, where I, I feel has been where everything happens, you know, and of course, like, I love having written, right. Um, and I love that people, you know, uh, have read my books and then tell me, but I also know that that's no longer my book anyway, right. It's no longer my story because the act of reading is its own art making. So, um, I don't always think of that as my success. It's just I put something out in the world that somebody else has engaged with and has found meaning and that's amazing. Um, but the, the success for me is just in the doing. Like I feel so privileged to be a writer and that I can do this and be part of that world is incredible to me. It's a really cool thought to think that all these little miniature success moments are happening extraneous of you too <laughs> like without you ever knowing these these connections of of your work potentially somewhere in time across the planet <laughs> it's really it's a nice way to look at it I have um I think a fairly interesting reflection on this because this is something that I've had to think about as well ever since I moved to Mexico and what you said also uh Emily makes it, it's so true you can't control your success you cannot predict the outcome of the world I think that's something philosophically I struggle with sometimes you cannot control outcomes you cannot affect things as much as you'd like but you know uh when I right now I and I'm also putting their books be, up because they're really brilliant uh in Chiapas I met this amazing collective called the Colectivos Nichimal Chil. they work in Maya Sotzil and, uh, you know, in Chiapas, I don't want to give too much information because <laughs> they don't want to, you know, backstab anyone either. But uh, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of problems getting published. There's a lot of internal, like any country, right? Uh, so this collective, they decided, you know, as people of our community, we're not going to kind of deal with it, you know? We're just going to choose to skew our names. We just want to write as connect as people of the Maya Sotil community, and we're just going to write beautiful poems, you know, about different aspects of our culture, like the sacred mother core and sacred mother moon, you know, what the planet means for us. And they don't even put their names in the book. They just write, and they, and they produce all their books themselves. They make them like these artisanal projects, you know, like with cotton and wool. And there's something so beautiful about this you know and when I met these people I just felt like you are doing uh, some of the most valiant artistic work I've heard in a while and I've, I'm surrounded by artists in, in, and also even very successful ones but still when I hear these stories I think you can't control success I mean these people are barely known no, their books probably have only sold like a few 20 30 copies I mean maybe more than that I'm, my point is there's so few people outside of this small little community that know anything about this work and yet it's so valiant so wonderful you know so I would tell to anyone who thinks about success, you know, accept it, you know, you cannot accept, I mean, you cannot change the outcome. You can only try to do your best to create the works you believe in and just hope that maybe someone will read it, maybe someone will understand it, but that's not a reason to not stop. You have to keep trying. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a nice way to think about it too. Like at all points you are successful then if you just accept what the outcome is. <laughs> at all points as a writer, you are successful then. Um, Prakash, did I see you had something to say? Yeah, um, kind of like, oh yeah, I think like sort of like success is like a constantly moving metric. And 
yeah, I think is also this thing that becomes therefore a little bit unattainable uh, for a lot of people, right? Which is why I don't know we have billionaires because people cannot be satisfied with just being rich. They have to be, you know, uber ultra rich. And um, like for me <clears throat> personally, <clears throat> excuse me, like I mentioned in my story, I used to be a scientist, uh, like working in nuclear waste, and now I'm like a finishing my first artist residency. Um, and so, yeah, clearly the metrics of success have changed. And I was like so impressed or like shocked when I had my first like academic publishing come out in like a hardcover book. And I was like, oh, I've made it. And then I'm like, oh, wait, the norm is to have publications like every year. I'm like, damn, this is like the metric has changed and adapted. And so, yeah. And so, like, now I guess for me, my next like goal, I guess, is to be able to like write the way I do in English, like thinking of kind of like the intertwining between art, uh, like academics, activism, but do that in French, which is the language that I work in mostly orally. And I feel like I don't have as strong writing skills, but yeah, that's my next step. Yeah, I mean, success is kind of a made up word and a made up concept too. So there is no one, <laughs> one way to look at it. Uh, Camila? Um, yeah, I've been actually thinking a lot about this lately um, because um, as, as most of you know, um, you can't generally support yourself as a poet. Um, writing ah. pays badly and poetry pays particularly badly. Um, but this past year I managed to like get three grants from various levels of government to write a book. Um, and I'm learning that there are a few poets out there who do cobble their life together this way, who manage to make a tiny sub poverty, but still, if you're very thrifty, sustainable living, just writing, but using the grant system to keep producing projects. And so I'm looking at this like, could this be me? I'm disabled, I have very little energy, and there are other considerations that make writing more difficult for me, like needing to use voice recognition software and so on. But I'm wondering like, about doing this. So this is one of the things I'm now considering. Like, could I get more of my income from writing by engaging more with the grant system? Um, and when I think of outcomes, though I totally agree that, um, yeah, outcomes are not things you can control, but things that I aim for, um, I would love to um, both publish my um, collection, which, which hopefully um, will be accepted for publication next year, um, but also to get it translated um, into Polish and Yiddish, maybe by me, maybe by other people. Um, and, um, and I know that there might not be a lot of market for it, especially in Poland because of the kinds of things I write. But on the other hand, there are Polish people out there just like me who are starving for this kind of work, who need to see work about autistics, about non-binary people, um, about Polish Jews. Um, and so um, I would love to, um, that would be a measure of success for me to make my writing available to um, Polish and Yiddish speakers. Um, in in their languages. Fantastic, thank you. I think that's a that's a really great. I mean, it, it, the idea of success is so different for all of us. It's just, and it and it is a moving target, and it does change even once you meet it. And that's it's, it's completely intangible. So, thanks for all of your perspectives on it. That's it's great to hear. Um, we are running out of time. Um, so I don't see any extra questions. So I'll skip to the good old Brockton classic, which is a, a great tradition we have of asking each of you to recommend a book, um, one that resonated with you. It can be a recent one. It can be one that you read five years ago and you just can't stop thinking about. Um, but please do, let's, let's hold up other writers and, uh, and suggest their work um, and uh, let me know what, let us know what, you, uh, what you've been reading that really has resonated with you lately. Um, I can go first. Oh, <laughs> so, sorry, carry on. I also had a book that I just pulled off the shelf, which is um, Indigenous Rights, a guide to um, First Nations, Métis and Inuit issues in Canada, which I feel like written by Chelsea Bell, who's like an amazing um, academic, and Métis scholar. And I think it's like really essential reading 
for people living in Canada who yeah, want or need to learn more about the history of like what's happened in this to like to like build this nation. Um, yeah, it's just like an in, 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 invaluable resource. That's it. Carrie Ann? This is coming out in August. I got an advanced review copy. So look for it. It's called Probably Ruby by Lisa Bird Wilson. She's a Métis writer um, and it's like a coming of age and it's so funny and so awesome. So there. <laughs> Camila, do you have a rec? Um, yeah, um, I um, I just finished a book that I loved that sort of gutted me, which I think is, you know, some of the, uh, the best books out there. Um, I can't remember the exact title. I believe it's called We Are Not Dead by Dana Smith. Um, I was trying to look it up, but my software was being slow. Um, but it's the writer is Dennis Smith, who is a non-binary um, black queer poet um, living with um, HIV. Um, and the book is amazing. Um, I had to read it in really small amounts because it's so intense, but it's so highly recommended. Um, and my other recommendation um, is Freya Benson's recent book. Um, Freya Benson is a trans woman. Um, and I believe the book is called something like The Anxiety Book for Trans People. Also a marvelous resource, highly recommended. Even if you're not trans, you might benefit. I find that Freya's writing about anxiety and like practical ways to manage it in your life while taking into consideration your marginalization and how safe you are in the world is great. Like, honestly, I, I would recommend it to anyone um, because of how I think practical and relevant it is to most people who experience oppression. Thanks, Camila. I found it while you were while you were speaking. It's "Don't Call Us Dead" by Dennis. So, thank you. That's great. Thanks um, so and... much for finding the right title. <laughs> I really <laughs> want to recommend this book to everyone. So, thank you. Uh, great. Um, and Kiran, how about you? Well, I feel like I've been indirectly giving recommendations, <laughs> so I feel like <laughs> I don't know if I should then directly give one. The problem is they're all in uh, bilingually in Spanish and different. Mayan languages like Subsil Sitsalcho, which no one probably reads. I mean, not, I mean, in this context, I mean. Uh, so I could, that being said, I have read and reviewed a lot of amazing books that I do think that I would love to give a little shout out to. One is um, a short story collection by Yogesh Maitreya, who's an Indian writer, who's a Dalit writer, who wrote really piece. I'm just going to write these names in the chat box because otherwise in my, <laughs> later you can kind of um, give them to the people who might be interested. He writes really piecing short stories about what it means to be Dalit in India. And it's really like his, his style is very Kafka-esque and piercing and philosophical. Uh, he also is very much small press published and he does a lot of the work on his own, but he really is also again, fighting the good fight. Another one is Michelle Cahill, who's a, uh, the, actually she's an Australian writer of Indian origin. She wrote this wonderful book called Vishwarupa, uh, which uh, kind of also kind of, travels around the world through a poetic eye. I mean, parts of the poems are written in Beirut and Mumbai and so many different spaces, you know, and Sydney as well. I mean, it's uh, it's really wonderful. So there's um, there's a lot of interesting writers, I feel. So it's, it's only just a matter of um, trying to find them as well, you know, and spending that time because there's, I mean, there's so many wonderful literatures coming out of these places that we normally don't think about. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just going to ask Sonia if she's still with us, if she wants to uh, to share a, a favorite book. Um, but I could ask you, Dorian, too, if you have one recently that you've read um, uh, to recommend for our folks. Uh, well, I am currently reading Crosshairs by Catherine Hernandez. So, I mean, I can't even think about any other books. I can't wait to read it. In my brain. It's just... Um, and for those who aren't familiar, I mean, we love Catherine Hernandez here at Brockton. Um, but this book, like, it's so, it's, a, it's kind of a dystopian near future situation, but it's like so real, uh, particularly to me because it's like set like in my neighborhood in Toronto um, with all these queer people who are exactly like people I know who are my friends. Um, and uh, it's 
an incredible read that I highly recommend. What about you, Emily? Amazing. Um, I can't wait to read Catherine's book and I don't have it yet. And I would, I, that's hopefully my summer read when I go away. Um, I am reading um, Sulphur Tongue by Rebecca Salazar. And I am really excited because um, Rebecca is going to be joining us for Brockton um, in the coming season. So that's, that's also exciting and I'm really enjoying it. So um, yeah. So that's, that's a great segue to our next show. Exactly. It just <laughs> is. <laughs> So we will wrap up now. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, coming and watching us on YouTube. Uh, please share this video around afterwards. Thank you so much to our readers and our guest speaker. Um, it's always so wonderful. And I think there's just been such powerful uh, pieces tonight and funny as well. Wellness Twitter. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the falling uh, picture, we all love that. Um, so keep coming back. Our next Brockton is at September 8th, 2021. Uh, and we'll start off the new Brockton season with Antonio Michael Downing, C.L. Polk, Fonda Lee, and Janina Curtin. So those are very exciting names. Um, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, see you on September 8th. Thank you for your time. Have a good night.